closed. So uh, just remember, everybody, won't you? We're live. Are we live? Okay, thank you. Um, welcome to Communities Committee. Um, it's nice to see everybody in the room and congratulations on your elections, uh, most of you. <laughs> Some of you didn't stand, did you? Uh, but uh, for those councillors, well done. Okay, so item one on the agenda is over to you, Noel. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. It's simply to note the appointment of yourself as the chairman of this committee and uh, Councillor Tom Smith as vice chairman of the committee. Thanks. There's Thank no you. decisions to be taken, it's just for noting. Thanks. Thank you. And also item two, um, handing over to you, um, Noel. Yes, thanks, membership. Th thanks, Chairman. Sim similarly, it's simply we have a new committee with new terms of reference and membership, and it's for us to note what was decided at full council uh, without any substantive discussion. Thanks. Thank you very much. Item three, apologies for absence. I'm presuming we're all present and correct. Yeah, no, no apologies received, Chair. Thank you very much. Item four, is there any declarations of interest by members and officers? Disclosable pecuniary interests or private? Yes, Sue. Thank you, Chairman. A private interest on agenda item six, please. My husband is a voluntary driver for the door-to-door. -door. I actually keep his car on the road, but he does go out of the kitchen when he has a job to do, which is a bonus. <laughs> Thank you, Sue, for the detailed information. <laughs> Uh, Councillor Guilford. Chairman, I think we should declare that I'm, I'm a board member from the County Council for Inspire. Thank you, Glyn, and I'll declare myself as a board member for Inspire. Thank you very much. Item five, then, is the establishment of the COVID-19 Partnership Social Recovery Fund. And I believe Mark Walker should be online. Thank you, Mark. Good afternoon, Chair. Afternoon, all. Um, Firstly, apologies, not sure how or why, but the paper in the pack has lost the title on the document itself. But just to confirm, the title of this paper is Establishment of the COVID Partnership Social Recovery Fund. Um, if I may I just start with a little bit of context, it's relevant to all the papers that I will present today. Uh, throughout the pandemic, a wide range of organisations have pulled together around the common purpose of providing practical support to those that need it in the county. Um, and these organisations have included a range of public sector bodies and, of course, a wide range, a wide variety of voluntary community groups, some of which are new, some are well established, um, but they've been on the front line of, of response. And the system in Nottinghamshire to join those up to join those in need up with the support available was developed fast and with enormous amounts of efforts and goodwill contributed by all. Um, that system is known as the Nottinghamshire um, Community Support Hub. Um, the hub reports into the local resilience forum as a humanitarian assistance group. Um, the government over the period has devolved responsibility to two local hubs to provide support to the clinically extremely vulnerable cohort. There was 50,000 of those in, in, in Nottinghamshire at the end, up until the end of March. And currently the hub has responsibility for providing support to those that have to self-isolate due to COVID. So there's still response that's un, uh, going on. Um, the government has provided funding to the system to the hubs to provide this support um, and it came to the county council of course as the upper tier local authority it's become clear from the work of the partners that the pandemic has had some uh, longer term impacts i'm sure you've all seen and felt these in, uh, in your own communities um, a process is currently underway to identify the needs created or exacerbated um, for particular cohorts by the pandemic uh, with a view to formulate partnership plans to help address some of those needs before they before they reach a crisis point. So the paper in front of you today sets out some examples of the needs identified and proposes the establishment of initial £1 million partnership social recovery fund to help meet these needs. Uh, partners are, are currently working to identify interventions that will deliver benefits um, beyond the period of this this funding um, and it's proposed that those intervention plans will pre be presented to the local resilience forum humanitarian assistance group for appropriate partnership endorsement before being presented to the communities committee for formal decision making approval thank you chair thank you mark 
Um, the recommendations are on page 10 of the pack, which is recommendation one, the committee approves and the establishment of the COVID-19 social recovery fund. And item two, that regular reports on the expenditure from this fund are brought to the community's committee. So I propose that recommendation. Do I have a seconder, please? Uh, thank you, Chairman. Happy to second that. Thank you very much. So it's open to members of the committee. Anybody wish? Anybody wish to speak? Councillor Guilfoyle. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, Chairman, just uh, obviously there's a uh, an extensive uh, list of uh, priorities that have been identified, and I uh, I know this was raised uh, else elsewhere. And I, don't want to duplicate things, but I think in the list, one of one of the uh, areas where I believe people have uh, suffered uh, due to the uh, COVID issues are, are young mums. And I know that's been raised in the health, health scrutiny and health and wellbeing. And I, d I don't know whether that would fit into this as, as one of those, because this these groups do span a, a number of issues. And, and clearly during this period, you know, uh, the the number of uh, young mums who have given birth during this period, the kids have been in isolation as well as the mums, and I'm sure that well, I, you know, the development of some of them have been um, probably not as good as what it should. In some cases, it may have been better because they've had more contact with the parents, um, but what they've not been able to do is mix with other groups, and I think that something along we need to look at that and and and, and investigate if we can. And, and see whether there is any, any opportunity to sort of pull that back. Um, another one that's not down here, but is mentioned, and, and it's not, in, and is the food supply, because that has been a big issue throughout. Although it's mentioned within the sort of preamble at 12, it's not sort of clearly identified in the uh, top 10 priority. And I think that is still a priority for some people as we're moving out. Uh, the issue regarding food. We don't know uh, clearly uh, what's going to happen on the 21st of June. Uh, we keep hearing little bits and it may, it may not or whatever, or, or it may be part or it may not be part. Uh, but clearly, you know, there still will be uh, a case for food to be a particular priority. And, and, and I think that ought to be highlighted, you know, a little bit more within, within the group. Um, also, I think one of the things that I would, from my point of view, and I'm sure other members, uh, would like to know what is actually going on in their locality around these issues as well. And I know that can be sometimes difficult to sort of bring together. Um, but I've, uh, in the last couple of weeks, have, have uh, myself started to get out and about, which I've not been doing previously, um, and talking to more people. Uh, and I'm finding that there are things that are going off. There are other things that have stopped. Uh, and I just, you know, for me, it would be good if we can know exactly what assistance is being given in the areas that, that we, you know, in our localities. Um, and, and also when it comes to looking at where money is being spent, if we can be informed about that, as opposed to sort of um, waiting until we come to a committee or whatever, so that we've got an idea and we may, you know, we may be able to help with any of the decision making process. We might, in some cases, end it. Uh, well, that's always a member's prerogative, isn't it? <laughs> you yeah, smiling. Uh, hold on, where's... I'm looking for the member for Ashfield. Uh, but, you know, so from 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 our point of view, you know, uh, I'm sure it would be good that we could get that because I know there's gaps. I also know that there's there's a lot of people who've got interesting ideas and I, we won't be able to feed that into the process. Thanks, Glenn. There's a few questions there, so I was going to take all the questions, but we'll go we'll go back to Mark and uh, let him come back on some of those. Thanks, Mark. Okay, thank you, thank you, Chair. Thank you, uh, Councillor Guilfoyle. Yes, there is a, a, a fair list of um, priorities there, and actually some of them overlap as well. You can get people that sit in, in maybe one or more of these groups, and we're sort of, um, you know, very conscious of, of, of the overlap between groups. In terms of trying to um, find out and to reduce duplication, the, the, the pandemic and the process of working with partners has meant, um, you know, we're doing a lot, having lots and lots of conversations and trying to identify those people inside internal to the county council but also externally across the um across the 
voluntary and community sector as well, um, to bring them in to help us formulate this needs assessment. Very, very happy, um, Councillor Guilfoyle, if you've got local information, want to be involved to, to channel that information into the process because I say nobody's got a perfect view of the world as it were it's a complex world out there and we're trying our best to, to get that picture as as, as as comprehensive as possible regarding food supply the reason it's not specifically mentioned in this report is because uh, we've secured some money from the um, contain um, county council funding on food supply and currently there is a food supply plan that is, in, is is being developed it's in a quite an advanced state of development led by kathy holmes in in public health and working um, with food banks, with social supermarkets, social eating projects, uh, food clubs all across the county. So they have, they are working up that that plan. But there's there's a there's another pot of funding, as it were, that's been put aside to do that. But yeah, absolutely recognise that food supply is a fundamental and, a, and an important priority that we um, that we need to work on. Um, with regards to your point about locality, what's going on, um, if I can't, if, I'm, if I may take that away and, and um, have a look into that and see how we could uh, present information um, that, that would be of use to local members, I'm certainly happy to do that. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Mark. OK, Glenn, on that. Yep. Thank you. Um, Councillor Williamson, Elizabeth Williamson. Thank you. Um, thank you. Mr Chairman, on behalf of the independent group. Uh, Excuse me, just to interrupt you, would you just pull the microphone across so that sorry. anybody, thank you. Is that better? Yeah, it's brilliant. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, yes, yeah, so on behalf of the independent group, I'd uh, welcome this report. And <clears throat> as this is the first meeting of the Communities Committee, can I congratulate you, Councillor Cotty, on your appointment as the new chairman? Um, in paragraph three of the report, it acknowledges uh, the continued partnership between the seven borough and districts, the county, our health and emergency service partners and the voluntary and community sectors. All the way throughout the pandemic, I've been heavily involved in the operation of Brinsley Food Bank. We are one of the groups who, like so many, gave their time to support vulnerable communities and residents in places like Brinsley, Eastwood, Greasley, Underwood and Watnall. And I'm proud that as volunteers supported by the county, uh, we provided a service that was a lifesaver to so many. Local councils like Broxtow Borough Council played a blinder during this pandemic. We paid particular focus on supporting businesses, retailers and other traders. Like all borough and district councils in the county, we took on the job of paying out various grants to businesses on behalf of the government. We paid grants via backs to 98% of qualifying businesses. And we're actually third best payer outers uh, in, in the country, I believe, on that. So that's, that's really well done to Broxtow. Uh, in paragraph 10 of the report, you mentioned the 10 priority groups. Can I ask you, Mr Chairman, that unpaid carers are added to the list? The latest figures show that mental health issues have risen during successive pandemics with unpaid carers. It's often a job that's distressing for those unsung heroes who care for loved ones. We need to recognise this and prioritise helping them. Also missing from the, this list are the tens of thousands of residents in Nottinghamshire still working from home. Whilst many have welcomed this, my daughter being one of them, Others have complained of isolation and anxiety caused by the lack of interaction with others. I'd be grateful, Mr Chairman, if these could be added to your list. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'll pass that uh, over to Mark. Um, can you come thank back on that, please, Mark? Thank you. Yep, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Yeah. Um, Obviously, the, the information in, contained in today's um, report is a summary, if you like, of where we are. But just to say, uh, we've already got um, uh, support for carers um, down as, a, as an issue that, that we, we, we are exploring at the moment. And so, yes, we can certainly, um, you know, that will be picked up within the needs assessment 
the, the needs assessment process. In terms of working, uh, work, those residents working from home, um, we've we've obviously we've we've got areas we're looking at in terms of loneliness and and um, other low level mental health needs. So hopefully, if there are people that are suffering from those type of issues by virtue of working from home, there are there are already projects that are up and running um, out there uh, that we've been involved with um, as as the as the system, as it were, in order to um, d deliver on that. So, but we are actually. Um, in terms of the loneliness um, ag agenda, there is National Loneliness Week next week, and we're doing some media ar around that to share with share with people out there where they can find um, support. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Mark. Uh, Councillor Daniel William Williamson. Uh, thank you, Chair. Can everybody hear me all right? Yep. I think so. Yeah. Okay. Well, if not, I've got quite a loud voice, so this should carry <laughs> reasonably well. Um, Tim, looking, looking at the report, I know the example cohorts, but one that um, I am really keen to see us um, push forward with this and make sure we support are the domestic abuse victims that are identified in paragraph 11. Um, I think we all know, I, I know from my own area, I'm sure many of you know from your, your areas, domestic abuse is, is something that unfortunately has is, is rapidly increased during lockdown. Uh, I have a a few brief figures from uh, Refuge, one of the domestic violence charities. Um, and between, what was it, between January and March 2020, before the first lockdown in the UK, they recorded an average of just over 8,000 calls a month. Between April 2020 and February of this year, uh, that is up more than 60% on the average, because I believe it's up to over 13,000 calls and messages um, every month now to the to their hotlines, um, an alarming proportion of these seem to be from domestic abuse victims that either don't want to reach out because many of them don't want to see themselves as a burden or overburden in the hospitals or the police or anything else like that. Um, and well, there is a staggering, a staggering amount of them that seem to be living in the fear of immediate violence, threats to be killed, everything else. So whilst these are example cohorts, I would very much like to push that this committee makes that one as one of the huge priorities of the cohort, as it is a, a, a massively understated problem that I think we're only just beginning beginning to get to grips with. Um, so that's the first part. In this session, um, I welcome that we've got this partnership social recovery fund. I welcome that we've got the million uh, pound in funding. Um, the bit, I don't know if it's just because it's my first meeting and maybe somebody can point me in the right direction, but uh, the report states in paragraph 15, I believe it is, that this will be funded using a combination of council reserves and any additional government grants provided for the specific purpose of meeting the social needs of our community throughout the year. Um, so my question is, if we Beyond this, we have no additional government grants end up being forthcoming. Um, how do we fund this moving forward? Does the money just come out of reserves? Does it just come out of county council reserves? Does it come from the district? Um, I'm just very keen to make sure, because I, I really support this, and I think it's a fantastic thing that this committee wants to do, but I want to make sure that we have the funding in place and it's, it's not just going to fall through. If somebody could answer that for me, I'd be quite grateful. I'm doing a good job of passing the book on here. Um, so I'm going to go back to Mark and make sure, but um, I know that there will be probably a bit more than a million pounds, but at this moment in time, I think we're quoting what we know, but I'll pass it over to Mark. Uh, yeah, thank you, Chair, and thank you, Councillor Williamson, for that. Um, so in terms of the uh, finances, the government have provided uh, pots of money for things like shielding and to support self-isolation. Self At the moment, there is more left in those pots than, than a million. Uh, a million is a starting point, if you like, though, and it helps to focus the mind and focus the plans. But we, the report does say that we, we, you know, we, can, we can come back to this committee to seek additional funding. And clearly, finance colleagues would, um, yeah, would look to that maybe from if there wasn't anything left, they, then it would come from the county council reserves if we brought it back to, to to this this committee so that's the answer in terms of funding in terms of domestic abuse yeah there i know the detailed plans that partners are already working up there's a number of ideas there in order to support the the issues that are being faced by those services at the front line providing support um, to, to the victims and so yeah i can assure assure the committee that is an absolute top priority for um for for the fund and where the monies might go Thank you, Mark. Um, Councillor Jonathan Wheeler. 
Thank you, Chairman, and really much uh, welcome this report. I think what's really been fantastic to see in the last few last year year and a half is what the council has done in terms of the community hub and supporting all the many groups out there. I mean, for example, one locally in my area, West Bridgeshire Community Helpers, where I was team leader for, and having to support the county council and Royal Council as well was uh, crucial to uh, be able to get out there early and to help as many people as possible. Looking at the report and, and on item eight with the 10 priority cohorts has been mentioned about a couple of us to add to there. I think my real question is, is going to be there's a limited amount of resource, obviously, uh, to obviously resource to start with when you go from standing start to putting this together. Is there a priority within the priority, which now might sound a bit a bit dap, obviously, when you're trying to go to custom at two wide, I want to make sure we're not going too wide to start with and look at a few areas and building out there when we've got the resource in, in place to be able to deliver it and um, to make sure, like I say, we want to make sure we do it effectively rather than just saying we want to 10 or 15 lots of cohorts and not be able to go out there as far so just to uh, clarify that please chairman okay thank you over to you mark <laughs> it's going to be a again, day, yeah. isn't it you know <laughs> thank you um i think you make an excellent point there councillor wheeler around car you know there's a balance to be had between casting the net too wide and to identifying um too many issues if you like but what we do intend to do is um is colleagues from across the the different groups of partners that are pulling this together we're going to create a long list of ideas um hopefully collect data around what the problems are and also um information in in terms of what the outcomes are that the particular funding can can could achieve um and then at that point we would be pulling together a short list of recommendations based on the sort of cost benefit analysis of of, of, of what can be achieved. And, I've, and I say that would then be bought. It would go through to the, through to the partnership, the humanitarian assistance group of the local resilience forum for input there, if you like, for endorsement there before being brought to this committee for sign off. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. Uh, Derek Higton, you wanted to say something. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, just to um, add, uh, uh, a little bit more to Mark's um, answer there, um, and I should introduce myself, uh, members. So I'm Derek Higton, Service Director for Communities and Place um, with the County Council. Um, but um, it's worth saying, uh, in addition to what Mark has said, members, that those um, priority groups that we've identified in the report, of course, they're not mutually exclusive. So um, uh, an individual resident may fall into a, a number of those individual categories, actually. So. Um, in the same way um, that what we won't end up with is kind of 10 plans for 10 uh, separate cohorts, um, we'll also uh, find that the support that we offer um, in communities and through the Social Recovery Fund will meet the needs of, hopefully meet the needs of, uh, a number of individuals who fall into a number of different categories. So our, the programmes that we develop will not fit neatly with one particular cohort but will meet the needs of a number of cohorts i suspect um, um over time because of course that reflects the complexity of the societies and the kind of family structures that we all um, live with and, and operate within um as well so um I, I suppose really all i'm saying is that it, it's important for us to guard against this sense that we've got lots of different clusters of need because actually once you're in in a community all of that tends to merge together um, particularly around things Council Guildford like food support because all of those um, categories fall into the, the realms of people who might need food support on an ongoing um, basis. So um, what we'll try to do when we come back with future reports is um, present to you some of that um, kind of complexity as well uh, as simply as we can um, um, because um, it's important that we don't think about these kind of social problems in straight lines I suppose. That was it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Derek. Any, any, you want to come back? Yep. Sorry, sorry, Chairman. You just say thank you for that. And also just to say as well, there are, for example, at the district level, I know that Rushka Borough Council runs a project called Reach Rushka to help um, self, uh, isolation. So rather than perhaps reinventing the wheel and putting more resources in, work with those councils to see what they're doing, which might hopefully help you resource wise and to and obviously ultimately help the residents. Thank you very much. Any other speakers at all? OK, it's been proposed and seconded, so we'll go to a vote by hand, please. Uh, those in favour of the recommendations, please show. I don't have to go any further. Thank you. Unanimous. Thank you very much. Item number six is compact between public sector bodies and the voluntary and community sector in Nottinghamshire. And over to you, Mark. <laughs> Thank you, Chair, once again. Um, yeah, so uh, as, as I've mentioned, the pandemic 
has sharply brought into focus the importance of the voluntary and community sector. Um, it has renewed and energised the relationships between the public sector organisations and, and the, the voluntary and community sector. The, the collaboration that's gone on really shows how much more effective the system can be when, when as partners we all work together. A working group of the Community Support Hub has been looking at how the progress and the relationships that have been forged over the last 16 months can really be built upon and taken forward in the pandemic recovery period and beyond. And I say that this working group consisted of a range of partners, including representatives from the voluntary and community sector. Um, the group felt that an agreement or a compact between the partners would be an important foundation stone um, and hugely symbolic really in terms of the relationships um, and as such they developed the compact uh, which is set out uh, appendix appendix as appendix one to today's report and that that say that was developed the compact was presented to the local resilience forum humanitarian assistance group in april and it was it, it unanimously endorsed by the um, local resilience forum partners there so all the partners in the forum across the city and the county are being asked to take back to their own organisations and to seek approval to adopt the compact. So the report in front of you today seeks approval for the County Council to adopt the compact as a key partner in the Local Resilience Forum. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Mark. Recommendation is on page 15 that the committee approves the adoption of the compact by the Council. I propose that recommendation. Happy to second that, Chairman. Thank you. I was going to ask for a seconder, but thank you very much. <laughs> OK, any questions or comments from members? Lynn, Councillor Guilford. Thank you, Chairman. And I know we've done it before, but I'd still like to place on uh, record uh, my tribute to the voluntary and community sector in Nottinghamshire uh, and, and the partners in the city and the districts for the, for the fantastic contribution over the last 18 months uh, in particular, filling in the gaps in services that we, we, we know that there are there, uh, helping the county council to feed, signpost, direct and protect our most vulnerable people. And we can't, can't do anything more than that, but thank them for all the work that they've done. Welcome the compact very much. It's not dissimilar to the one that I think was done uh, some time ago. So it, it really does need refreshing. Um, I think the last time it was done, it is from talking was... 10 more years. I remember uh, actually going out and, and talking to the voluntary sector about it, and it was the first compact that we, we sort of saw, sorted. Uh, it did take some time to draw up, to, to actually get agreement on that, as daft as it may seem. It wasn't an easy um, ride, so to speak, because obviously um, there are a number of voluntary sectors and they all have different ideas and different views about things, and you think it might be easy to get them to sign up to a a simple form, but uh, sometimes it can be a little bit more difficult. But I, but I think, you know, it, it, it's something that needs to be done and, and also to recognise them formally uh, by, by the compact. Um, it, it would be good once you've, you've gone through that we could have a, a definitive list that comes out of that, that we can sort of see to see who signed up, you know, to the compact. Um, and also then just to see if there are voluntary groups that we know in our areas that have probably not uh, not signed up and find out why, you know, because clearly uh, I, I would presume if they're in the compact, then it, that's where they will be also considered about for funding and issues like that. So, um, and there may be good reasons why they won't sign up to it, but it, it would be good to know and also good to, to sort of have that. So if we could at some point um, when we've got that, have the list of the uh, def definitive list of people who have signed up to it so we can, you know, talk to our, uh, voluntary sector colleagues. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, Glyn. I don't think we can disagree with anything that you've said there, but I will pass over to Mark if he wants to make any comment on that. Great. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, uh, Councillor Guilford. Yes, this this builds on a, uh, a the previous uh, the, the, the compact. I think it was from 2013 or 2014. The thing about this one is is that it goes further in terms of it's not just done from a county council perspective. It's all 
um, public sector organisations in Nottingham and Nottinghamshire have agreed this. This has been developed with uh, Nottinghamshire together, the infrastructure groups of in infrastructure groups, if you like, in the in the in the sector as well. So, hopefully, taking on board your point around getting people to sign up, we've by by um, the the way the method by which it's been done this time, hopefully we we will be able to um, secure sign up. But certainly, yes, that having a list of who signed up, I think, is really really important to publicize it uh, so everybody's really clear on, on on who is in this in this partnership i think would be really good so we can take that away and make that happen thank you mark any other members wish to speak councillor daniel Will williamson excuse me i'm croaking <clears throat> thanks daniel that's quite all right you just following me now mr cotty with the croakiness um, obviously i've um, obviously i've I welcome the report and I, I welcome uh, the move towards compact. We all know what an amazing job the public sector bodies have done during this, what the voluntary sector has done. Uh, I mean, in Ashfield, we have groups such as Ashfield Voluntary Action, who supported our community, working with local councils, health and local voluntary sectors, but else to make sure that everybody could access support safely and effectively. Um, we have a transport group, actually, in, in my own division, named Our Centre, based in Kirby, who were amazing. Uh, they ferried people to the vaccinations, they dropped off food, they did everything that they could possibly have done, which I'm sure we can all appreciate, considering some of the horrific weather that we had at the start of this year. It wasn't an easy task for them. Um, I have a question and a suggestion, really, Mr Chairman. So uh, my question is, do we um, understand like, what impact uh, the pandemic has had on the voluntary and community sector in places like Ashfield, Brockstone, Mansfield, Rushcliffe uh, and the rest of Nottinghamshire? Many of them have had a year of lost fundraising and revenue, as well as extra expenses coming out to do all this fantastic work. It's taken its toll on a lot of them. And if you look at... Um, the voluntary sector as a whole, I believe they're facing something like a £10 billion gap uh, nationally between the income it expects to have and the financial demand on its its services. So if we, could, if we have a real good look at what impact it's had on those services here in Nottinghamshire, I think that'd be very good. Um, can I also suggest that as part of this process and as part of the process that mm -hmm. Councillor Guilfoyle suggested of, of creating the list, um, the if possible, we do a review of the financial state of the voluntary and community groups work within the sector um, in light of all this lost income so that they can continue to make a, a positive impact within our communities. That's all for me. OK, thank you. I think some of that work has been done, but I will pass over to Mark again. Thank you, Mark. Uh, great. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Yes. Um, so the compact was actually step one in the in the in, in a piece of work looking at the resilience of the community and voluntary sector across the local resilience forum. So um, what will the, the second step or the second part of this, once we get the compact signed up, we will be doing a state of the sector um, survey where we will be gathering that exactly that information. Uh, Councillor Williamson, you've just you, you've just articulated for us to get a real, really good hand again as a partnership um, you know what does it look like post post pandemic so there we can then uh, look to, to put the support into the the, the, the right type of areas etc thank you chair thank you very much uh, councillor wheeler okay thank you Chairman. i think it's worth placing on record the thanks to the previous administration for the bringing forward the cdf funding application open because actually at that time that we did that we were able to actually i know my division to support many local groups at the time who were struggling uh, due to COVID not be able to fundraise. And I've been able to do that since. I know many other members have. And I know there's a lot of thanks from those organisations to the council. So I think that to go to the officers who uh, really facilitated that in the early days to get that was requested and, and sorted. I know it was a, a lot of work. And I think as well to say that the voluntary sector and the work we do out there, you know, the we should place on record real thanks to the volunteers who are working hard in the community and also to say that as we're going to get on with the LDF funding with our CDF funds as well, the fact that we've still got five thousand pounds spend a year, even with the current financial um, situation, of the council and the and the wider economy is going to be absolutely vital to support these organisations and to say to new members, if you're not sure how to spend that money effectively on the organisation, to speak to other councillors because actually using that funding the right way to support these organisations can be a, a lifeline as well. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, Nobody else wishes to speak. Do you want to come back on anything, Mark? Are you okay? Yeah, I, th yeah. I, th 
Glyn. That's good, thank you. Uh, Glyn, uh, do you want to come back? It was just a clarification, the CDF, the problem is on CDF, we cannot give the CDF fund to voluntary organisations for their revenue commitments. So yeah, that's part of the, the, the ruling. So we can't, in reality, uh, most of the problems that the uh, voluntary sector have are uh, paying their staff, and we cannot commit to that from our CDF. We can, we can give a grant to uh, for equipment or, or things like that, but not towards the revenue funding. So it's just so that other councils don't come in saying, oh, I want to pay for this worker or yeah. whatever, or towards the salary of that. We can't do it, you know, so... Yeah, thank you for bringing that up, Glenn. Yeah, thank you. Appreciate that. OK, so no other speakers. So we'll move to the vote then. Uh, those in favour of the recommendation, please show. Thank you. That's unanimous. So uh, item seven, Mark, you get a rest now. So thank you. <laughs> um, report from the service director uh, for... No, let's start again. Culture, learning and libraries inspire development update, fifth year review. Thank you, Peter. Peter Gore. Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> Just going to play with equipment. Uh, good afternoon, members. Um, my name is Peter Gore. I'm the Chief Executive of Inspire Culture, Learning and Libraries. Uh, which is the charitable mutual society that the County Council set up in 2015-16 um, to deliver a range of cultural and learning services for Nottinghamshire. Um, so each year we bring a, uh, an annual report to the relevant committee um, and to give an overview of, of the work that we've been doing and the, the current state of uh, play in terms of the organisation's health. Um, this year, obviously, with, with new the new administration, new councillors, um, I thought I'd also include a little bit more about who we are and what we do, um, not making an assumption that you you know all of that. Um, so, and of course, this year has been a very different year for us because of the pandemic. So you'll see in your report, I tried to cover um, the organisation's uh, performance, quality assurance against our contract, um, our accreditations that we've gained, our financial position, um, the dividend that we get from being a mutual uh, organisation, um, our governance, the health of our governance, and um, the achievements and highlights, which to be frank, as I was writing on, I had to stop at a certain point because it was just too much to write, um, and that'll come across in the presentation. Um, and then uh, some a little bit of detail about how we responded as an organisation based out in communities um, around COVID, um, both in terms of during the, the last 15 months and our plans for the future in terms of contribution to recovery. Um, so I'm going to take you through a, a a briefish presentation, give Mark a little rest. Okay, so just, just to outline, um, so our governance and contracts. So as I mentioned, we're a community benefit society, which is a membership based uh, organization. So our staff are members and the public can be members and that gives them voting rights and a range of other uh, access to information about the organization. Um, and so our board is made up of um, two nominated county councillors, um, which uh, the chair and Councillor Glyn Foyle are uh, currently on the board. We have four co-opted members, we have four uh, elected from the community, we have one staff elected and the chief executive. Um, so we're a charitable uh, organisation, we have uh, charitable objects and we're not for profit. Um, uh, we have an independent board, we have a contract with county council um, and we just finished our first five years uh, last March and then from this April onwards uh, we've had agreement for a further five years to deliver that range of services on behalf of the County Council. So there's a very weighty contract tone which we keep in the corner of the office and only refer to on the odd occasion. Um, uh, and we report contractually to the Council, um, to Derek and colleagues uh, quarterly. Um, we also have some direct contracts with the Arts Council as what's called a national portfolio organisation. So that's a regularly funded organisation for periods of time to deliver um, some of the Arts Council outputs. Um, and for Nottinghamshire, that's a programme of uh, cultural activity uh, aimed at children and young people. And we're also the hosting organisation for the Music Education Hub for Nottinghamshire, which is a Arts Council administered programme funded by the DfE. 
So that's that's where our funding and our work come from. So just to give you a quick breakdown of the scope of services provided by Inspire, um, Inspire tends to be synonymous with libraries in, in, in the sight of most people um, in the county. Um, and libraries make up a, a good chunk of what we do and they're the backbone of what we, uh, how we deliver things. Um, but about 50% of our activity and funding is around libraries and the rest of it is, covers these other services. So I thought I'd just run through them. Um, so we provide arts and cultural services and the majority of that work is working with young people. Um, we have an education library service, which is a schools library service, um, which provides a, a buyback service to schools in both the city and Nottinghamshire um, and nurseries. Uh, we have a learning and skills service, which provides our adult learning programme, which you'll see a little bit of later in the presentation, and a skills for young people programme um, for 16 to 19 year olds or 16 to 25 year olds, uh, if they have an e EHCP plan. Um, and we have about between two, 270 to 290 young people on that programme each year, and that's um, based around vocational skills. Uh, as I mentioned, we're the Music Hub, but we also provide musical instrumental teaching uh, for schools across Nottinghamshire. And we're operating in about 72% of schools, both for the Education Library Service and for the Music Service. Um, we also deliver the Nottinghamshire Archive Service for the County Council, um, which covers the historical records of the county and city um, from 1155. Um, and we have a specialist building in the city, which I'm sure at some point we can arrange a visit to. Um, previous committees have uh, found that very informative and enjoy enjoyable activity. Um, and then we have a library service, a public library service, which uh, the County Council has a statutory duty to provide, and we provide that on behalf of the County Council. And we have 60 library um, buildings, and we have three public service mobile libraries, um, from very small libraries um, to very large libraries. <laughs> uh, so a really big um, portfolio of sites. And then we have a records management service, which is an internal service for the County Council, provided by our archive colleagues, uh, which manages the semi-current paper records of the County Council um, and worked right through the pandemic and didn't stop at all. Um, so just to mention some of the accreditation um, that's happened in the last year. Um, so we've been approved as a matrix provider, um, which is a standard that you uh, apply to adhere to around information and advice and guidance um, around employment, skills, training and life opportunities. Um, so that's not just limited to our learning service, but that's that that, that um, provision is right across. So if you go into a library and ask questions about training courses, employment opportunities, um, we, we, we're accredited to, to deliver that kind of information, advice and guidance. Um, we're a customer service excellence um, service right across uh, our Inspire services. Our customer feedback is always positive. Um, compliments always outstrip complaints. Um, we have a target of meeting customer satisfaction, good or very good, of 90% plus. Usually it's around 95 or 96%. Um, but this uh, award tests us on that. Um, and the Library and Archive Service has been accredited since 2000. No, before I came actually. So, so well. So if you go into the if you go down into the council chamber in the awards, there's a great big plaque of the first award, and it used to be called Charter Mark. Um, so there's a long history of, of being very good at it. Um, I've put the local government association and the arts council down this year because just to remind me to mention that we went through a li library service LGA peer review in February, um, which was their first virtual one in cultural services, um, and we'll bring bring in a report to this committee in next month. Um, so um, I'll, I'll save you, save the highlights for them. Um, RSL is a, a rock school music organisation, which we've just become an accreditation centre for, so that's good. And we're also rolling out dementia friendly among friends amongst uh, our frontline staff. And we're really proud to share the news that we were also um, FE, Further Education Awards winners for 2020 as National Adult and Community Learning Provider of the Year. Um, which is, uh, I gather, really high status in the FE and learning world. So we're very pleased to get that. Um, a range of projects and programmes that we are involved in, and this is just a snapshot and just a snapshot of what's been happening this year. Um, so we're a partner in the Major to Minor programme, um, doing some really good uh, work around heritage and arts in the Sherwood Forest area. 
Um, we're continuing our dementia film screening work, which started off with a grant um, from the Arts Council, and then we've had some LIS funding for that. Um, and we'll be currently that's provided at Mansfield Central Library, where we've got theatre, but we've, the LIS funding will allow us to have a mobile kit so we can take that out to more places. And we're a partner in something called Way to Work, which is a uh, employability program, uh, which we're working in partnership with a range of other bodies across the city and the county. Um, really successful work um, at the moment. That our, our, our performance is really um, quite well, very good. Um, uh, Skegby and Kirkby uh, libraries, are, we, we're doing some rewilding projects, some small um, garden areas with LIS funding as well. And we have an old library um, in Mansfield, which is our youth arts and community arts centre. And we've had some funding to improve disability access in that building. Um, as an Arts Council MPO, we've continued uh, a range of uh, projects during uh, the year. And you'll see at the video at the end of the presentation some of the work that we've been doing. Um, uh, we've also had some award this year for something called uh, Reading Befriending or Reading Friends. And that's a DCMS funded and reading agency funded project where um, we were asked library staff were working with people who are uh, extremely, extremely clinically, extremely vulnerable and uh, staying at home. So, um, again, really successful outcomes of that. Um, in November 2019, Workshop Library was flooded, seriously flooded. Um, and Workshop Library is one of our strategic libraries, one of our larger sites. Um, and so last year was a, a year of restoration, I think, in that sense. And finally reopened to the public in the spring. Um, and we achieved what we wanted to, which was a complete refit and um, I would say a refresh and a modernisation of that. Councillor Gilfield might want to comment, but I think it was um, we came out the right side of it um, and we put some extra investment in to make sure it was up to scratch. A Ladybrook, uh, one of our smaller libraries, had a uh, small refurbishment and Retford Library, one of our larger libraries and I would say most complex in terms of its Georgian origin, origins, its Victorian front and its 1950s extension um, was uh, fully refurbished. So that was a, and we reopened it virtually uh, last September. And the old library is also having a lighting upgrade, which is a part of a, a programme that we're doing in terms of energy efficiency um, to improve uh, or to reduce our energy uh, usage uh, and we whilst closed we took the advantage of being closed and we redecorated 20 sites so that's good to keep them fresh so our covid response and recovery um our first response uh, after closing every site uh, uh, on the 21st of march um was to think about how we can continue providing our offer so um and i think one of the freedoms of being outside of the county council um was the ability that we could quickly deploy um, changes to our virtual offer and up our game in terms of what we were able to provide. So we quickly brought together some resources, re-engineered our, in our website, um, moved our learning programme online, um, opened up some of the restricted resources that we have, things like and Ancestry, um, which you can only use in one of our buildings, change the licensing arrangements um, so people can search for family history at home. Which I think is still the case. So if you if you want to dip into that before you can't, or you have to pay for it, then um, that, take advantage of that. Um, so all our areas of service started to think about and started to mobilise um, how to, act, to provide content online and deal with service requests online. Some really good stuff. Uh, just recommend you go and have a look. Um, some examples there of some key strategic result, um, events. So we had Simon Armitage, Poet Laureate, did a session with us, which was extremely popular. Um, uh, really well managed and taken up. Um, our Education Library Service ran a special uh, book award for schools. Um, we were key partners in two virtual festivals, Upload and Not Stopping Festival, um, which was about giving people the opportunity to share music and drama, etc., cetera, um, with a partnership. And our um, local poet, Henry Normal, um, was due to do a 60 library tour last year, but he did a 60 library virtual tour. Um, and engage with lots of people. Our COVID current position is that majority of libraries are open, um, but they're, they're working on kind of reduced capacity and reduced hours due to the restrictions that are in place. Um, during COVID, we mobilised a click and collect service and a home delivery service. Um, we're allowing browsing, IT use, uh, information provision, print and scanning, um, and we're working on increasing access as we can. 
Um, we've got quite a lot of vacancies because a lot of staff haven't come back from not being at work. We've, we've got some issues around capacity um, and we're working within the guidance. So we, we await the announcement on whenever um, to, to, to free that up. Um, heavy demand from a lot of our customers, which makes you realise when you stop doing something, how important things are to people. Um, our adult learning programme um, quickly moved to online delivery, to 100% on delivery from a standing start of zero. Um, and it's worked very, very well. So we've learned a lot. Um, and you'll hear one of the learners in the videos in a, in a moment talking about her experience. And our study programme, vocational, hard to do, bricklaying, construction, painting, decorating and catering um, virtually. And so our tutors have worked really hard to provide that that face-to-face -face contact in a safe way, um, as well as, you know, providing laptops, etc. And our services to schools, both music and education library services, have really worked right through. Um, they've, they've hardly stopped. Um, and schools actually have been keener to use us, and they've really relied on the resources that we provide. Um, so it's been, it's really been some very positive experiences. I'm not going to read out the customer feedback. Uh, there's quite a lot of it in the report. There's lots of it on the screen. There's lots of it. We, we keep getting people uh, just telling us, you know, what we've done. So I thought you'd prefer to hear somebody else's voice uh, rather than me or Mark. And so I've got a few little uh, snippets. So I, hope you can... I think it's been difficult for everyone. Well, the worst it was being the, the whole pandemic. Some tackles on that. We're getting a little bit frustrating a little bit in time, as if you know what I mean. There are people out there that are struggling a lot worse than you. And, um, Inspire has been a massive help with, with getting it. I never thought a few years ago that we'd be sat at home doing college work at home with the dogs surrounded by you, you know, literally, quite literally on the kitchen table. Um, so, no, Inspire has been really helpful, you know, with warm for sending the laptops out. Like I said, they are, you know, brand new, clean, shiny, never been used before. The laptops, they're as good as you'd ever want. They're not like the old slow ones. They're brand new. We have a, we have a Teams call every month morning every wednesday morning usually so you know, as, as knowing that the actual college is just down the road and you're not actually allowed into the base we are still connected we're all still talking you know we, we all still have the opportunity to speak to each other and you know now we're all getting on and you know we're, we're we are a friend we are a friendly group to be honest with you um i think if anyone's out there worrying about people not being friendly i don't think i've ever met one person that's, that's genuinely not been a, a lovely person so you know have the opportunity to speak to all of them people every monday and wednesday and being able to stay connected with that group um and also like i said the support as well always be aggressive you know are you all right are you doing your work fine is there anything we can help you with you know are you struggling um anything like that so it's been really supported really good um i'd 100 percent to say i'm happy so the next one is from a library user. I really did believe that Inspire done really well to, you know, do what it does. I know it's once a month, but, um, and I tell other people throughout the country, my sister in Gloucestershire about it, they haven't got anything like it. They've got, they've got libraries that haven't done what Inspire have done. So it's a sort of trailblazer. I wanted people to get to know that as a recipient of the uh, benefits of it, I was really pleased. And then Anna, who's one of our lockdown learners. My name's Anna, and I have been taking part in several of the Inspire courses, Pilates and Patchwork and Crochet, Meditation and Mindfulness. The courses have given me lots of things to think about, lots of people to talk to, because lockdown has been quite isolating, especially when, like myself, I'm disabled and my means of transport is my mobility scooter. The classes have all been maximum of 12 people in them, so you don't get lost in a big group of people. And I don't have a very loud voice, so I don't feel like people talk over me and I get to be able to, to speak and have my point of view heard, just like everybody else does. All the tutors have been lovely. They're all very different, but they all have the same kind of approach in that they listen to you, they give advice when you've asked for it, but they don't really overstep the mark and tell you what to do all the time. People should think about accessing Inspire Learning courses because it gives you something new to learn, keeps your brain active, especially in these times of pandemic, and learning new skills. 
there's so much you can learn, not just crafts, not just Pilates, like that's one of the courses that I've loved um, as my physio sessions had all finished because of the pandemic. Um, so Pilates has kept my physical health going. My mental health has been kept going by all the thinking about different skills, different, different meditation courses and mindfulness. And it's just given me some people to talk to and made, I've made some lovely friends through it. And as I said, that's kind of typical feedback. Um, so um, during the summer last year, we decided that we needed to be on the front foot in terms of our response. Um, so we um, we sent a leaflet out as part of our learning brochure distribution, really to highlight the things that we were doing and, and what was accessible. Um, but we, we are focusing on um, how we can support um, people who are seeking employment and for business. And so there's a couple of um, developments there, including um, a development in partnership with the British Library around business information and business support um, that we uh, will be developing over the next couple of months. Um, and then, as Anna said in her um, video clip, people's well-being and thinking about how we can further help people in terms of supporting their well-being, um, as mentioned in the report. So looking forward, um, Inspire is looking at developing its volunteering offer and membership engagement. Um, we have 66,000 members, people have signed up and uh, our aspiration is to get them more engaged in, in what we do. Um, we want to re contribute to the, count to the county's recovery and to the council priorities. Um, we are active in Towns Fund in Ashfield and um, around the two digital innovation centres at Kirkby and Sutton Libraries and the Construction Centre as part of our learning offer. Um, our MPO work will have to be reapplied for, um, so there's another round for that, so that's be something we're focusing on. Um, and we're looking at specific pieces of fundraising for our youth arts work around disabled young people, and uh, hopefully we're aiming to create a dance hub in Nottinghamshire. Um, and then recovery of our footfall and our learner numbers, making sure that our services are as accessible to people and encouraging and supporting them back out. Um, and we know there's some reticence out there in the community. Um, so this is the final slide, and it's a video of our um, MPO and cultural offer for the year.
And finally, always some dates for your diary. So um, we hope to run our, our awards night this year, um, which obviously didn't do last year. So the provisional date is 30th of September. So all members will get an invite. Um, it's a really good evening. You can see face to face, hopefully, <laughs> the work that um, our customers, our volunteers, our staff do. And then the Inspired Christmas Concert, which doubles up for the county's, uh, county council's Christmas concert, the Royal Concert Hall, on Monday, the evening of Monday, the 6th of December. So um, put that in your diaries. Thank you very much, Peter. Yes, get them in your diaries. A good night's out. I think off, online we lost some of the video because we're just oh dear. double watching, but I, I will send it wasn't our fault. I will send them a link. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. OK, is there, uh, there's a recommendation on the paper, which is to inform members of the development of Inspire and the delivery of cultural learning and library services across Nottinghamshire and its achievements in the fifth year of operation. And I propose that recommendation to have a second, please. Thank you, Chairman. Happy to second in due appropriate time. Thank you very much. Is there any questions anybody would like to ask to Peter? We'll start there and work around, if that's OK. Councillor Williamson. No, I'm just testing you now. <laughs> thank you. It's me then. Can you hear me this time? Uh, thank you, Mr Chairman, and thanks, Peter, for that, that uh, presentation. It was brilliant. Um, so in the report, it talks about, uh, on par in paragraph 18, it talks about the success of libraries. This was after a number of statements about cost-cutting measures. My local library is Eastwood Library, and it serves a community of well over 30,000 residents in places like Brinsley, Greasley, and whatnot, and of course Eastwood. Eastwood's probably most famous for literary giant D.H. Lawrence. Uh, in the town where we celebrate our greatest son, his birthplace museum on Victoria Street is open two hours a week more than our library. Our library is open on a Monday from 9.30 till 1.30, Thursday 9.30 till 4, and Saturday mornings from 9.30 till 1.30. That's just 14 hours a week. Are the reduced hours in places like Eastwood, Huthwaite, Annesley, Ladybrook, etc., a reason for this saving? We have a building that lays empty for the majority of the week, Mr Chairman, and buildings that could be used as a commercial opportunity to make money and plough back into staffing to open our libraries for longer. For example, we have suggested that the police take advantage of, uh, for using these buildings as a drop-in centre. So can I request, Mr Chairman, that we do a thorough review uh, of Inspire's role in our library service as a whole? A library open for just 14 hours a week doesn't inspire me, and I'm certain that it wouldn't inspire D.H. Lawrence or his lover. Thank you. Well, I don't think we're responsible for D.H. Lawrence and uh, his, his building. I think that falls on the district. I'm not sure, but I think so. Yeah, you're correct, um, but my point is yeah. that that museum is open for longer than the library is. I appreciate that, that but that we do have 60 libraries, but I'm, I'll allow Peter to answer that. Yeah, I, th I think, um, no, I don't, I, I'm not 100% sure, but Eastwood, I think, is contractually due to open more out than 14 hours, but currently we'll probably be operating 14 hours because of COVID restrictions. So the opening hours are probably more than you've quoted, so I'll, I'll, I'll clarify that for you. Um, in 2009-10, the opening hours of the library service were reduced by 22%. Uh, since that period of time, um, and since Inspire has been instituted, we've uh, we've increased those hours, hours by about seven percent um, against against the, the the contractual arrangements. So we are working to increase open hours where we can. Um, so and we do work with partners. So we've had a few schemes: um, Blidith, um, Cockgrave, Eastleigh. We've worked with either parish or district council to um, provide increased access by hosting their services. So there are models. And we're all, always open to that. Experience with the police is they're not willing to pay, um, but we're always open to the conversation around that. Um, so, uh, you know, that, that's the situation. Derek, do you want to do you want to come in on that as well? Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Uh, um, and uh, yes, just to follow up on um, uh, Peter's um, uh, uh, point, and each was my local uh, Nottinghamshire um, library as well, uh, and. Uh, I'm a big fan of D.H. Lawrence too. Um, uh, as far as uh, our opening hours are concerned, just to say, as Peter said, we, 
they've remained unchanged from the council's perspective um, in the, for the last um, 11 years or so um, now. Um, but we'd be more than happy to have a conversation with yourself and other local members about how we can perhaps work with um, uh, community groups uh, and as Peter said, local councils as well to think about um, different ways of operating libraries so that we can start to perhaps extend their opening hours. We've got many examples across the county where we've managed to do that successfully because we, we do face some financial um, challenges. Um, so if we could work um, in partnership with yourself and, and, and other local members to look at um, what that might look like in all of those local libraries uh, you mentioned, we'd be more than happy um, uh, to do so because there's some potential real benefits um, there of bringing the community back into the libraries, particularly given where we've been for the last um, year or so. Uh, and from memory, I would have thought, Peter, that Eastwood would be contractually open much more like 20 odd hours than, than 14. Yeah. But um, yeah, so that might be a conversation that we can have um, uh, after the committee. We, we also have the pleasure of not closing a library since the 2008 financial crisis. Um, we've modernised and spent money on libraries going forward, whichever administration's been in. So we, we are positive about our libraries and we're happy to work with anyone. So, yeah. OK. Um, Pauline, thank you. Um, you know what I'm going to say, don't you? I do, but say it. Can I say it? Um, I want to have a little of that stardust that he's sprinkling all over the place. Uh, we were around when Inspire got started. In fact, myself and John Knight turned the logo from circles to petals. There you are. So I have to say that every time I see the Inspire logo, I have this little urge to say, I did that. And I might have even fought John to make it petals, not circles. I think I might have done, yes. Very new, very new with the link. Uh, but Peter knows my um, absolute adoration of libraries and books, wherever they are. And I've also been involved in lots of the other things that Inspire do. I remember going to the music centre in the old Mansfield Library and putting my foot in mightily when I said, do you produce <coughs> proper music? <laughs> it's, um, it's quite stunning that the man still st speaks to me. Uh, he probably thought it was a joke, but in fact, I was being serious. There's this whole studio there that produces amazing stuff. And then if you go round the whole of the county, um, the kids who produce magic music, magic plays, poetry reading, and everything. I could go on longer than Peter, probably, but I'm very, very proud of it. And to my dying day, I shall sure think this is one of the good things that we did. I could go on, John. So Thank John you, Pauline. Also. No, I, I knew you were going to say it, but it's nice to hear it, as because my passion is similar to yours from day one in 2001. I was opposition spokesman for culture, which included the libraries, so I've gone all the way through it. And my new vice chairman was warned that he wouldn't have a chance to get anywhere near Inspire unless he was going with me. So, And he's not going and I mean to that close nicely. the library. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> we didn't close the libraries. Yeah, no, so thank you. Thank you. Um, Sue, Councillor Sousa. Thank you, Chairman. Well, first of all, I would like to say thank you, Peter, for that lovely video showing the children, showing what the children did throughout the uh, time that they weren't able to actually go into a library. I think it was wonderful. And I would like to recognise and thank you and your department for what you did throughout the pandemic. Um, you were able to continue the services to the young, to the people who were living alone, and um, you adapted your service to suit. And although many libraries physically closed, you were able to keep your service going. And I think there's credit to the whole of your department. And I would like that noting, please. And um, may I say also, the Christmas concert at the Royal Concert Hall is an absolute gem. Glad to see it will be back, hopefully this year. And I mean, it is truly lovely. And, you know, I wish you every success in the future because I think it's a wonderful service and I think you've done so well during the COVID um, that you do need to be congratulated. Because when people have been stuck at home, 
and they've been on their own. They've had very little to turn to uh, without their friends. And the library has been their friends. So I, I think it's wonderful. So thank you very much. Thank you, Sue. Uh, Councillor Wheeler. Thank you, Chair. And I think also, Peter, first chance to say again, congratulations on your honour in the Queen's Honours list. I think that actually shows the great work you've done, you've done, your department's done to uh, really keep the library, well, just wider than the library survey. A lot of people would say it's just library survey. When you actually see the presentation, see the amount of work you do to go over and above and beyond, I think that's absolutely uh, key. And, and in terms of the investments that you put into the local communities, I mean, for example, West Bridge Library, which is close to my division, which my local residents use, I mean, the council has invested heavily in that building, but the services that you provide there and also working with community groups, as you say, I think it's commented earlier about empty space and buildings, but I think working with local council when they come forward and community groups to use those spaces, we see at Cockgrave, they've got fantastic work done there, and which library these spaces can be used, but it's, up to, it's not just up to yourself and the county council to push that forward. It's going to be pushed forward by the community groups and local organisations come forward and ask to use them. And uh, I just want to say on record again, thank you for the work that you've done. And uh, I said, I know the residents really enjoy that, the space they've got their library and, and the young people sent to next door and uh, keep going the great work. Thank you. Councillor Guilford. Yes, Chairman, just, I mean, you did say about the workshop library and it does look magnificent uh, since it's uh, open, I think. The, di the big issue is about getting, as you say, the footfall back up. Because um, the I know I was speaking with the uh, catering staff there that uh, do the coffee shop, which is a brilliant little coffee shop, and and they were saying that you know they were struggling and and the, because they 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 weren't able to take advantage of some of the grants because of the way that they that fund and whatever, and I didn't know whether there was anything that we could look at internally laterally with the county council on that to support because they were saying these next few weeks will be very difficult for them in the fact of getting uh, an income coming in um but it, it is a beautiful setting and, it, and it's it's marvelous what, what's being done in fact i took my granddaughter in last week for the first time to look around so that was that was brilliant she's only she's only one but she loves books and she was going up pulling the books off and having a look and you know so it, yeah yeah it's, it's it, so it's, it's brilliant, you know, there. I think everybody in here, you know, we all praise the library, but I think what I'll, I'll make a plea, because I know the board members, who, again, have done a tremendous amount of work uh, with yourself and, and, and John and Everett to, to continue to keep the service running and to, uh, on behalf of the council, to, to monitor what's been going off and to challenge officers when necessary uh, and to support them when necessary. Um, but I think, you know, one of the things that they always find it difficult and uh, not being lo local authority members is funding. And uh, funding's always difficult. And I think one of the pleas that they've made, and I'll make it here on behalf of them and the board, is uh, could they have some security in the sense of uh, inflationary rise as opposed to telling them to make a few more savings? Because, to, to be honest, they are near to the bone now. There is no doubt about it that they, you know, they've done what was was asked them initially. They've they've made a load of savings, um, and they've drawn in, as you can see on on the papers, they uh, not an insignificant amount of money from numerous organisations to supplement uh, the services throughout Nottinghamshire. Uh, and without that effort, you know, the, we've seen some of those other things uh, go by the wayside. So, so there is, yeah, there is a lot. Uh, there is some plaudits needed for them. But I think also uh, what I want to see is the, the uh, yeah, the library hours extended in places where we can. Um, but all that comes down to at the end of the day is money. And um, we're all, every side is playing for that. But what I would say is that even if we could only guarantee them over the next few years, uh, the money that you've got plus the inflation so it can continue on a level playing field for the next few years. That that would be a, uh, a bonus. I'm going to go to Derek in a moment, in a second, but that inflation has been, uh, should we say, looked at. So I'll, I'll, pa I'll pass it over to, to Derek. Thanks, Chairman. Uh, yes, just to uh, emphasise that one. I know that you're aware, uh, Councillor Guilford, uh, from, from the board meetings, but we have, uh, as part of the new contractual arrangement, or uh, uh, updated contractual arrangement with um, um, Inspire. Um, uh, it in included an um, inflation uplift in the contract for this year, and that's something that we'll keep under review on an annual basis uh, going forward. 
um, because we're very well aware that um, uh, Inspire, Peter and colleagues over the last few years have delivered for us some significant um, efficiency savings that hasn't impacted upon um, uh, the operation of the library service or any of the other services. In fact, whilst the financial envelope has contracted for Inspire, the overall public offer has expanded, including in many cases um, opening hours as well for libraries. Um, so we're, we're really keen to ensure that none of that is prejudiced by kind of uh, future contraction and inflationary uplifts on an annual basis in the contract are a significant part of that um, because um, there's only so uh, far an organisation can go in continually driving out efficiencies and uh, savings that don't impact upon the front line. And, and, and we recognise that Inspire is getting very close to that point. Thank you very much. Chairman, I forgot yep. my one last point was about the Christmas concert. And I know this year it was online and uh, I watched it. And for the first time, my mum had been to previous ones, but obviously of an age now where she can't travel so much. So it was, she sat and watched it together. And I'm just wondering whether, you know, we're going to look at whether that can be put out again because we get more people watching it um, than what, you know, as well as people attending it, which is brilliant because live is good. But if you can't travel and you can have that opportunity to watch it on a video, um, that's even better. I think I think it's really interesting. We, we had um, 1,330 um, households access the Christmas concert. Um, normally at the Royal Concert Hall, we probably get about 800, 850 attendances. So there is a lesson about accessibility through a blended option, which um, if we can do with our partner, Royal Concert Hall and the Music Hub, we will do that. Um, and I think our learning programme will be looking at blended options as well, because for some people, Anna, for example, um, where mobility is a restriction, online has, has worked really well for us. We've learned quite a lot. Just picking up on the cafe at Workshop, we've I had conversations with um, Sandra yesterday, so we're, we're, we're sorted. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, we'll go to the... Sorry, Maureen. Sorry, Maureen. Did you want to say something? Thank you, Chairman, if you wouldn't mind. Uh, my, first of all, uh, Peter, well done, you and the team. Uh, you've done a cracking job, but I won't go on because I think you're, everybody's, excuse me a minute, I haven't switched off. Um, everybody said well done to you, so I won't go any further. But what I would like to suggest, as Chairman, you've got so many new people that have joined um, the County Council this time, who are not aware of all the wonderful things that Inspire does and has done in the past and continues to do, then what I would like to suggest is that perhaps the newbies have a session with Peter Gore when we can actually, Deputy Chief Executive, when we can get back into the count, in County Hall and actually take them through everything so that they are aware. And to you, Peter, as you are short of staff, or you, I, I don't think I misheard you, you did say you were short of staff, didn't you, as people were leaving. Well, perhaps one of the things we ought to be looking at is perhaps trying, trying to get most, we've got a lot of young people unemployed in the county, People who've come out of university, come out of college, come out of A-levels, who are looking for a job, let's try and sweep them up and put them into culture and life. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, thank you, Councillor Dobson. Um, yes, uh, so Inspire is actually hosting 31 kickstart placements, um, which is a government scheme for 16 to 24 year olds. Um, so, if, if possible, we will gateway some of those into permanent employment where we can. Good, good, good. But and, we, and yes, Maureen, we will be looking at taking them on the tour around the county. And we Shall might we even call in to see you. Oh, you're very welcome. You're very <laughs> welcome. Yeah, thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, then. We'll go to the vote. Then, thank you. Those in favour of the recommendation, please show. Thank you. That's unanimous. Item eight is the local improvement scheme options for the future. Hopefully Mark might be there still. 
I'm still here. Thank you, Mark. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, we can hear you. Thank you. Loud and clear. Cool. OK, thank you. Um, so members will recall that the existing um, county council grant funding scheme, the local improvement scheme, uh, is now coming to a uh, natural close. Uh, that had a three year funding cycle. Existing revenue grants end on the 30th of June, 30th this month. Um, existing capital grants, the deadline for completion of those projects uh, was extended to the end of December this year. Um, the paper that you have explores a range of options for the future of uh, County Council grant funding. The options that we've identified and their relative pros and cons are set out in uh, detail Appendix 1. Uh, the options and the recommendations have been developed based on learning and feedback from members, uh, recipients um, and groups over the course of the existing scheme. Um, what is being proposed today is that the authority should have a funding scheme going forward, uh, that to give some time to develop that the new scheme, the detail, the detail of it is worked up and brought to, brought to the September committee uh, based, of course, on, on what feedback members have today. Um, that given the importance of the sector and to limit any issues from a gap in re revenue funding um, granted by the authority, that existing revenue grants are extended until the 31st of March and that the provision of new funding should start for the new scheme should start on the, uh, the, on the 1st of April. I just want to finish by highlighting the specifics of the new schemes that, that have been proposed in the report and, and, and just how and why they differ to the previous scheme. So the idea is to have the same three parts to the scheme going forward. So revenue, a capital and a ta talented athletes part. For the revenue scheme, um, we're proposing them. There are two parts to that. Uh, the first one is a proposal to develop a scheme to commission larger organisations to deliver core services. Um, so not an application process, um, which is a, is, is a departure from um, what went before. But the second part of the revenue scheme would would be it would have a small grants rolling program um, on an on an annual an annual cycle. So what that would do is incorporate an opportunity for small grants to be applied for throughout the lifespan of the scheme, as opposed to only a once in a lifetime, which was what happened with the previous scheme. For the capital pot, we're proposing to introduce a rolling annual programme of awards uh, based on applications that, that, that are made. And again, that, that's a move away from a once a year process to give opportunities to people out there to come forward and to apply on an ongoing basis. And then finally, for the talented athletes part of the scheme, we, we want to expand the criteria of the previous scheme to provide a greater focus to support those more vulnerable athletes with protected characteristics. So the, the idea there is, is to uh, make the scheme more inclusive. OK, I will pause there, ch uh, Chair, if I may, and I'm happy to take any questions and feedback. Thank you, Mark. Um, I'll propose the recommendations which are on page 30. I won't read them all out because we have been going for nearly an hour and a half and um, give the time over to talk. So there's four recommendations there. I'm happy to propose those recommendations and do I have a second, please? Chairman, happy to second. Thank you very much indeed. So let's open the floor and get discussion under the way. Councillor Guilfoyle, thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Chairman, I'd like to uh, welcome the extension of the funding uh, to 2000, uh, 2022. Uh, as you know, uh, there are a lot of organisations who were, were feeling the pressure um, just prior to the election. And uh, by, by doing that, you, you relieve that pressure for obviously for another year. But also, I think uh, imp more importantly, it, it gives us that opportunity for the mapping exercise, which has been talked about earlier, to be done. Uh, and in one sense, some of the, uh, not the talented athletes or the um, capital scheme, but some, some of the discussion around whether we have uh, a big uh, community organisation uh, commission or whether we continue in the vein before, I actually think that argument can, could actually wait until the such time as we've been able to evaluate the size of the issue that's out there, um, because we don't know. And we've only got a finite amount of money. And if you end up saying, well, you're going to commission, there's a possibility that clearly, you, you know, some groups that are important could fall by the wayside. Some gaps that we know need funding 
um, may not be able to be funded. Uh, so for me personally, fully support it, fully support the, you know, the, the extension, but would sooner as slow down the process on how we then deliver it to know, to we know the size of the problem. Um, we know, you know, we all know, and also for instance, some of the issues around um, core funding, a lot of, you know, core funding is vital to many of the organizations, although obviously by the na name and the nature of the groups, you know, they are voluntary sector and voluntary workers. But at the end of the day, those voluntary workers need training. They need supervision and they need regular training and regular supervision and good training. And that costs, but you can't do that on the cheap. You, so you need a good core of professionals to enable that to happen. And if you skimp on core funding, then you get a bad, and we've seen many of them where they've started off and then eventually waned away. And, and for me, you know, we've got some very good groups here that we want, I, I would love to see sustained. And there are some groups that I don't, probably don't even know about that probably need a little bit more assistance. So I'd like, as I say, like to see that, that uh, overall uh, what's there. The other one is about the funding for the future. One of the things I sort of said is that um, if we go for a three-year funding cycle, we're going to end up in, in four years' time when the election is again with the same problem. that You can't commit because you don't know what's going to, you know, what's going to go off. And we, we, we end up where organisations that literally have got contracts of three years, because that's what they'll, they'll night time give to their employees, come into an end, and then they don't know whether they're going to be redundant, whatever. For me, I would sooner see you either give a two-year contract and then review that and a two-year follow-on. Because in reality, this year, whoever's in control this year, whether it, we manage to take it or independent or whatever else, the budget was set for this year. So in reality, we, you know, we, could, we could actually go for a four-year cycle because an incoming group is not going to, I'm sure, cut everybody's funding straight like that when they came in. So for me, I would sooner see a four, see that when we get down to that, that it's a four-year cycle, it takes over the electoral year, it gives any incoming administration, whether it's a new, new administration of this or whatever, it gives them that year again to have a look at it, to review the compact if, if it's necessary. Has it been working for us over the last period? But also to do probably even another mapping survey again just to check what groups are there and what gaps, because in four years, a lot can change. And, and there may be other things that we, we perhaps need. To, I, I've talked to some of my local voluntary sector group about this paper here today. And they, they, what, one of the concerns that they did have was, A, was about the core funding that is necessary. And that, um, yes, they understand where we say we don't want them to become too reliant on the NCC, but due to austerity, there aren't many other funding pots either. So they have come, you know, a lot of organisations have become reliant on us. Um, so, you know, that, that, that is a necessity. The other one is, is if you go to a major organisation to commission, do they know the locality? Do they know those local groups? Now, some of the local VCSs do, but not every area has got a successful VCS. I was talking to my colleague earlier, earlier who was saying, earlier, who was saying she doesn't know the state of the voluntary sector in Gedlin, as it happens, um, and, and whether the voluntary sector is still up and running and whatever else. Now, I know in Bassett Law, it's thriving. I know they're a very good organisation. And talking to some of the smaller groups who link very well with Bassett Law VCS, they probably wouldn't have a problem because they know, you know the, the, the links that they've got and that they understand their community, their locality. That might not be the case everywhere else. So again, you know, I think we've got to listen to to those concerns. So I, I probably come back to the initial one on saying, you know, we support the, the extension. In reality, I would sooner as not make a decision on the, the other bit of the funding until such time as we know what the state of the nation on voluntary sector is in Nottinghamshire. And then when we've got that, we can actually say, that's the money we've got. This is how we can afford to break it up. Um, in relation to the uh, talented athletes, totally support the fact that we put in uh, to cover more vulnerable uh, athletes and people. 
the only issue I've got is the fact that we seem to be diminishing the amounts. It's not a large amount that they got anyway, but by doing that and then saying, well, we're going to keep the, the sort of sum at the same, but it may be that they get less money as an individual. For me, I would sooner see us try, if we could, to put a few more pounds in to make it so that we could keep the level of funding to each of the athletes at the same level. Um, because when you look at it overall, and you, you know, we all know athletes who are going about travelling costs and various other things that they have to pay, um, it can be a substantial amount of money. And two hundred pounds or four hundred pounds don't go a long way, but if we diminish it to two hundred, it's, it's going to go even less. So, and I don't, and again, I know we're struggling financially or whatever, but I wondered whether we could just look at that and rather than actually say, well, we're going to give it to more people but diminish the the level of funding. I would sooner say, well, can't we have a bit of a plea for the amount of money and go to them and say, pull a bit out of reserves for it because it's worth it. It's worth it for the talented people that we bring through. And the end product, what we, we, you know, we see over the years with those athletes and the performance uh, and how it much does help to enhance it, uh, it's worth every penny that we put into it. I think, Chairman, the Oman notes. Thanks, Glyn. Don't disagree, and that's what this paper's here for. The yeah. first part was to ensure that, which is item one on the recommendation, that those... Um, voluntary groups we've been dealing with are looked after until we come around to the next cycle and give us time and for the reason that you know I hear what you say in two years four years so we want to take those on board and um, you know the the debate on this is is we put something in front and we want to hear what people have got to say so that's why we're doing it so I don't know if Mark wants to come back on that or do you want to wait for other people Mark to come in through with other comments yeah, I think it would be useful to hear from other colleagues first and then okay. come back. Yeah. So uh, I've got Councillor Daniel uh, Williamson, please. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair. So I just wanted to start off um, just with a bit of a question before I go um, off on any tangents. Um, as I understand it currently, obviously I'm new, but the um, existing um, LIS system that we use for any application, um, it needs to be match funded, doesn't it, by the organisation that applies. I am correct in that. I can see that's not in. So, yeah. Um, overall, this I've I've seen some of the work that the LIS scheme does, and I'm very very supportive of, of all the work. I mean, recently in my area, um, the parish council match funded a new play area through the LIS scheme. I visited it with, with Council Madden uh, many times after it's opened and it's, it's absolutely fantastic work. I think this money does does great things for communities. I'm, I'm really happy that we're looking at, at moving it forward and and extending, obviously, firstly until March while we review, but seeing, seeing where we can go. Um, my worry with with part of it is, and with just extending the system as is, is um, with the elements of of match funding. Like Annesley Parish Council could afford to match fund that play park. Other organisations, bigger organisations, can afford to match fund. But then you have very, very good groups, and many who did apply last year that I know of, the members of my own group tried to help with, they were unsuccessful because they couldn't meet elements such as the match funding. I mean, we have groups, uh, the Huthwaite Boxing Club, the Skegby Scouts, uh, the Riley Foundation um, over in East Audio, again, who were uh, fantastic group that work with autistic children um, but the, you know these are groups that's funding is stretched as is and they have no realistic ability really to match fund some of the projects that would really to to steal a phrase would help them to level up and provide the work that I think this funding is designed to do um, as I said I welcome that we're keeping it I welcome that there's a lot of recommendations to go through and be looked at um, but with your notes chair I'd, I'd really think that we need to remove the the match funding element at least um, through this extension period until 31st of March um, and see what applications come through see see what other groups come through try and while we work forward to go with it um, I'd be happy to move an amendment to remove the match funding if, if necessary. I'd like to move from if I can do it in writing if necessary. But I, I, t 
to me, it's it's the only way of ensuring that our poorest organisations and those that need it most in the areas actually have a fair chance. And while we've got this period where it's an extension where we're working through other matters, it seems to me a perfect opportunity to try it. That's all. Do you want to just come to that point, Derek, for us? Thank you. Yeah, uh, just to, uh, um, to, to pick up on that question around uh, uh, match um, funding, um, one of what, what, as far as the extension of the current um, uh, scheme is concerned, that 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 won't be an issue because we've already got recipients um, lined up, uh, and one of the proposals that we've got for the potential uh, revised local improvement schemes, and I'm talking here about revenue schemes or revenue funds rather than the capital side of the of the scheme is that um, if we look to um, uh, split the scheme into kind of larger more uh, infrastructure based awards and then smaller one off awards um, with a maximum I think it mentions in the paper there a maximum of say five thousand pounds it's for those smaller awards we can absolutely potentially look at uh, how we might relax the match funding um, arrangements um, because obviously we, you, you're dealing with very different projects um, then, both in terms of size and scope uh, and, and the nature of the projects themselves. So from a, um, a practical perspective, we can uh, um, absolutely take on board and review the, the nature of the match funding arrangements for those smaller revenue awards that we might then propose back to committee in um, uh, September. I think the issue for capital awards is, 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 a, is a different one because it's a general feature of most capital grant schemes that match funding um, is um, a, a available. Um, but if we were to look at major and minor capital awards in the future, then again, we could look at for the more minor awards, um, a, 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 a potential relaxation, not necessarily a full removal, but a relaxation and a more flexible approach around some of the match funding arrangements. Because we do recognise, and I know from the work that we did on the community fund, last year, um, uh, which we successfully managed as a, as a COVID response from the council's perspective, um, that um, the fact that we were able to be flexible about our funding was really helpful to small local groups in particular. So I suppose, Chairman, is, what I'm saying is that there is already the potential for us to look at some relaxation around match funding arrangements, but I'd emphasise that that would be really around the smaller awards rather than the big ones, um, because um, major awards, we need to put more kind of safeguards around it as far as the council's funding is concerned. From my perspective, is we're listening to what people are saying, and I accept what you're saying. I've heard that before. I have organisations in my patch that, excuse me, <clears throat> that couldn't afford to put their 50% in. So it has happened before. Um, so you don't have to put an amendment in unless you really wanted to, but we're taking that on board and the paper will come back September time for the debate to be had again if um, what you see isn't um, what you are thinking about, if you understand what I'm saying. Yeah. May I just... Um, I, I accept all that and I think it's fantastic. I welcome that because I, I do think there do needs to be that division between the two. Um, and I'm, I look forward to seeing what does come back to the committee. Um, I, I still have two issues with it. And the one they said we have uh, recipients who are ready. So the implication from that would be that we won't accept any fresh implication, uh, applications. We'll only work with recipients that we've already got in mind. That's correct. Yeah. That's correct. So yeah. we, only groups that have already applied are going to be able to get them on. There's nobody new going to be able to come through. Yeah. They're still going to be required to have the match funding. So we're not, there's, while we're reviewing this, there's not actually a chance here for any anybody else, any other groups to get in and try and try and see anything. I just think there's a chance for a different a different approach here and a different way of working. And I think if we wait until September, was that three, four months away, we're missing a golden opportunity. I, I strongly, strongly believe that this is something we should, act on now rather than wait. OK, I'll pass over to Adrian. Perhaps I can offer just um, an attempt at an explanation because I think we're perhaps talking about two different things. So the LIS revenue scheme that we're proposing to extend here has been running for three years and we commissioned uh, voluntary community sector organisations across the county to deliver a set set of services. 
technically their three-year funding settlement would have expired end of this month. I think that's right. Correct. And we're proposing to extend those organisations through to the end of the financial year. So um, that all feels right and proper because they've been working on a commissioned basis um, for the last three years. Uh, and um, based on some of the comments Councillor Guilfoyle was uh, making earlier, we acknowledge that those organisations face funding uncertainty. This will address that problem. I think what you're pointing to is what we want to look at going forward, which is when we bring forward an opportunity for organisations to bid again, being able to understand and differentiate between those organisations that might be commissioned to deliver kind of core services versus those that need some grant funding to do local projects. Um, what Councillor Coddy is trying to say is we're looking to review that scheme. And when we look to try and uh, bring forward new projects, when we invite bids to come from voluntary and community sector organisations across the county, we will have reviewed those issues, including the issue of, of match. So, of course, you're more than able to try and move an amendment, try and put something in, in writing. We can take that, we can consider it. Um, I think what we're trying to say is that those issues you flagged will be taken into account uh, when um, the review takes place. Of course, if you want to put some words down for an amendment, we can we can take that and we can have a look. Um, and those, I perfectly understand everything that has been said. I get the strong feeling they may not go, but I would still like to move an amendment that we remove the match funding during this time. I'm happy to put it in writing if necessary, Chair. Yeah, you need somebody to second it, if that's okay. I'll second that, Mr Chairman, thank you. No. So, yes. You know, no, I just want to outline the process, because we'll also need to make sure that it's a valid amendment. Yes, that's correct. We will have to receive that in writing. We will also have to call a, a, a brief pause in the meeting while we determine whether the amendment is valid and once that's done then uh, it is the amendment first of all that will be discussed before uh, and and decided upon should should we find it valid so what what we will require now is a um to have that in writing and we'll have to move a, a brief adjournment while we get that and also get um uh, give uh, the committee the opportunity to actually read it as well. Okay. Thank you. So. Um, as I'm not a member of the committee, but I came in purposely, as you well know, because Noel told you, because I wanted to pass comment on this particular item. Is it possible for me to just give my comments while the mover and the seconder of the amendment are actually physically writing what they want to move, the, what amendment they want to put before you? Just hang on a second, Maureen. Okay. Sorry, apologies. Um, Noel doesn't have a laptop with him at the moment, so if you could forward it to me, then I'll make sure that we can review it. Thank you, Councillor. Please do copy it in to me, but I think we will have to have that break. Maureen, if you would like to say uh, the yes, comments you'd like to make, and then we'll please. adjourn the meeting. That's fine. Um, what I would like to talk about is purely the capital funding, and I would like to make a plea uh, when Mark and the team and all of you and you are looking at reviewing the whole thing and bringing it back for September. Could I ask that on capital, Derek's partly touched on it, that probably you could look at very small grants like 5,000, but when you're looking at the bigger grants like 30,000, which, as you well know, one of my... Uh, did part of my division asked for, could I make a plea that the application forms are made a little bit more simplistic? And I do that not to criticise the staff because I brought people over, the staff met them and had those particular members of the community in an office, went through it with them. But at the end of the day, they were refused because they didn't have much funding. And to this day, 
the person or the two people that I brought across will argue that they had got match funding. So there is something that needs simplifying, Mark, through you, Chairman, to Mark. How you do it, that's down to you. But can I make that plea, please, Chairman? And then I can leave you. You certainly can, Maureen, and it's noted. Thank you. OK, we adjourn the meeting till four o'clock. Uh, sorry about the gap, but we need to take on board the amendment.
Okay, thank you. We're going to resume the meeting then, please. Thank you. Thank um, you. Adrian, thank you. Thank you, members, uh, and thank you for your indulgence. Um, I know it took a little bit longer than we'd um, uh, it hoped, but we've got there. Um, so you've all now seen um, the amendment that was proposed by uh, councillors Williamson's. Um, I've spoken to, to both the members of the in independent group. Um, we're not going to be accept ac accepting the amendment, uh, um, putting that before you, um, predominantly because the recommendation that um, uh, the amendment is uh, linked to uh, refers to LIS revenue grants that don't have a match funding element within them. So I can't put before you a, a motion to remove something that isn't there. Um, I've also conveyed a sense to Councillor Williamson as the mover of the recommendation of the amendment um, and relayed some of the uh, commitments to review the scheme where those sorts of issues around match funding can be considered. So in that case, members, um, we go back to the substantive motion. Um, Councillor uh, Cotty had proposed and Councillor Smith had seconded the recommendations one to four on page 30. And in effect, the debate is reopened. Thank you for the clarifications. OK, so um, we'll go back to the debate. Uh, were there any speakers that wish to say anything? OK, no further debate. OK, um, we'll go to the vote then. Uh, those in favour of the recommendation, please show. It's unanimous. OK, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, the next item is the work programme. Am I handing to you or? Yes. Yeah, thanks, Adrian. So members, just, just to offer you a brief um, uh, view. So the work programme is going to um, be a dynamic document that will no doubt evolve and, and change over time. Um, we've, we've taken an opportunity to put uh, some early sight for you of items that will come forward in, in July in particular, but also um, uh, a, a sense of what will come in the autumn. No doubt uh, the chairman and, and vice chair will, will want to have a view uh, and put their stamp on, on the committee in due course, at which point the work programme will, will start to be populated. Um, and as is, um, customary members are all uh, uh, able to flag items of interest and issues for, for the chairman to, to consider to add to the work programme here or no doubt in between meetings uh, as well. Thank you very much. Any comments from any members on the work programme? which is uh, very light, as uh, Adrian said at the moment. OK, thank you very much. Um, thank you to everybody for... Yep. Yep. The, the, the issue for me was the, the, the review we did talk about last time, about the review of emergency planning in the team. Obviously, they, uh, they've had the additionality put in, and, and I didn't know whether that was going to go on to the programme about the review. And I was going to suggest that... that Clearly, for me anyway, within all the issues that we've been talking about with the uh, funding and the compact and the way that we work with you, was about the community development team. Because, and, and also with, you know, looking at the policy and the some of the other projects that we're putting on, whether the, the community development team, whether there are sufficient resources within that team to do all the work that we would wish to be done with communities and whatever else in the next, you know, few years and whether whether there's that opportunity of reviewing the community development team I, and i'm not thinking about reviewing to scale down i'm not about whether there is sufficient resources in there okay derek yeah, yeah uh, yes thank you and i, and I, I totally appreciate the sentiment um, <laughs> um, uh, so um one of the things that um, i think is on the forward plan is uh, the development of a community engagement model yes uh, coming that's forward why. Um, and as part of that, one of the things we absolutely will be looking at is the amount of capacity and resource we need in staffing terms uh, to help us uh, deliver that when we've, when we've eventually um, uh, uh, agreed and developed the model. Um, so I think there is something about the community engagement um, model on the forward plan at the moment. But we'll pick up that resourcing issue as part of that. If, if, if you're OK with that, and we'll absolutely be bringing forward emergency planning related matters as well um, through this committee. Uh, we've just got to populate the plan to do so. Yeah, OK. That's yeah, the, the, they're not able to type at the moment because the fingers are too uh, bouncy, but it is the community engagement strategy in July meeting. OK, um, we take we note what you've said. Right. Thank you, Chairman. OK, anybody else? Thank you very much, everybody. First meeting and... Uh, See you again next month at least. Thank you.